All right, sveiki un labrīt. Um, as you can tell by my name, I'm actually Latvian, uh, but I'll be speaking in English today. My parents actually are both Latvian, and I was actually born and raised in the United States and have in the last few years um, been coming back more and more to Latvia, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, so this is probably one of my favorite topics in the world, is um, getting to sit down with people who are running creative businesses and convince them that in the middle of all your craziness of trying to grow your company, that you should step back and really care about your people strategy and your people process. And hiring that we just heard is one of those. But today I want to kind of convince you about the role that organizational culture in HR can actually play in improving any aspect of your business. Um, and I'm going to be drawing a lot of examples from my experience in Silicon Valley. I've been at Google for seven years, which I always say feels like 14 or 21 because it's a very fast-paced company, um, even though we're so big. Um, so I'll be drawing on a lot of my experiences and um, um, kind of observations from Silicon Valley. So what do you think of when you think of Silicon Valley? Something like this? Yeah? All right, everyone's got a lot of money. They're playing video games at work. <laughs> There's free food. All these big fancy buildings. This one's Oracle. I actually like that one. It's nicer than ours. Uh, Google, these beautiful buildings with solar arrays. This is Facebook. They have DJs at work spinning music. There's, no one's actually working. They're outside skateboarding, right? Um, and of course, this is financed by millions and billions of venture capital, and it's kind of this, this industry that's driven by huge amounts of money and creativity and innovation and um, it's fancy, it's magical, it's beautiful. Latvia could never be that way, right? Well, I disagree. Um, this is actually Apple's new headquarters, um, which is stunning. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is actually not all the fanciness, the bling, the perks, the free food. It's about what actually makes companies like Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter successful. And it's basically, you have all the ingredients that you need right here in this room and in Latvia, and it's basically people. Um, people working in small teams on hard problems, working in the conditions that bring out the best in people and make them innovative and productive. If you ask anyone at Google, why are you so successful? How can we be making $50 billion a year in revenue? $50 billion, one company a year. What do you think they say? Why are we successful? Our technology, the really, um, all the venture capital we got early, everyone says it's the people we hire, the way we grow them, the way we keep them, and the way we create the conditions for them to really be at their best. And it's really about those colleagues. And I'm going to kind of hopefully share some of that secret sauce that allows us to do that. Um, great. So today I want to talk about three things. I uh, briefly want to talk about some global trends, some really exciting things that are changing what we know about people in companies and how they should work um, and what we're looking for when it comes to people. Uh, and then I really want to kind of convince you why your people strategy matters, what the co components of it are, and what you can do about it. Um, and finally, I want to leave you with some concrete tools, things you can go back today, I promise you, and start doing um, with your company. So what does this make you feel? What's a, what's a word when you think of this that comes to mind? Dynamism. What'd you say? Dynamism. Dynamism. Fast. How about like, oh, my head hurts, it's too fast. Does anyone feel that way? Does anyone feel like they don't have enough time in their day? Yeah? Anyone feel like the world is changing really fast? I feel that way every day, and in fact, there's an entire study um, called Futurism and Accelerating Change that looks at how fast the world is changing. And being a business owner, you see those changes really quickly. And actually, the economic minister stole my first slide um, in his introduction. So I'm going to have to talk to him about that. Um, so there's been a rapid shift um, to an information, oh, that word's missing, economy. Um, <laughs> I promise it was there. And so over the last ten thousands of year, tens of thousands of years of human civilization, we moved from having an economy that's primarily focused on raw material extraction to one that then moved to manufacturing, 
then rapidly moved into a service economy, and now quickly, quickly is moving into an information economy. Um, and the main point here is that none of these ever go away fully, but the percentage of the economy that comes from these is changing very quickly. Do you feel that in Latvia too? What is it like lumber and timber? Those are big industries, but more and more we see that we're shifting. And being able to keep up with that change is a really big issue, especially when it comes to the kind of talent that you want to hire. Um, so my question for you to think about too is, if we're already here, what's next? And are we preparing for that? Um, my husband is actually a technology futurist, and he thinks it's actually going to be an era where we co-create meaning with our machines or our artificial intelligence. So I'll let you guys think about that one. That kind of blows my mind. Um, so trend number two, as more and more of our basic needs are met, as more people move out of poverty, as the world becomes safer, fewer people die of disease, our motivations change. And so the the, the motivations people have for their work are rapidly changing. So back in the day, maybe it was good enough to have a job that allowed you to buy a house or buy enough food or have safe, wa um, safe water. And then maybe you got to move to a nicer neighborhood where there was less crime. But now people also want love and belonging. They want to feel like they're part of something. They also want to feel good about what they do. And they actually want to basically become a fully realized human being. And one of the things you have to think about as a business owner is, if people are motivated by these things, how am I offering that to my employees? And that's a really big question to ask yourself. Um, one of my favorite books, if you guys haven't read this, it's a new book called Drive. Who's read it? OK, no one. Awesome. So I recommend that you read this book. Um, it's by Daniel Pink. It's a recent book. And it actually looks at all the most modern research on what motivates human beings. And he basically, through everything he read, he read every piece of motivational behavioral research, and he basically found that if you really want to focus on what's going to drive performance and personal satisfaction in work, there are three elements that people need. Autonomy, which is freedom, the ability to make your own decisions within reason. Mastery, the ability to get better at something so that you feel like an expert. And finally, purpose, connection to some sense of higher meaning that the work you're doing is actually has some kind of purpose on this earth. Um, and he basically finds when those conditions are present, people are more innovative, they're more productive, companies are more successful. So I want to actually take a second to ask you, and answer in your own head, do you feel that your employees, the people you work with, or you yourself, do you have autonomy, do you have mastery, do you have purpose in every single day in your job? It's a high bar, but this is where the science is telling us that we have to go to create world-class companies. Um, the third trend I want to talk about is just data. We've all heard it, data, data, data. There is so much data out there, but I'm going to talk about data about people. There's a growing body of research and literature about the science of human performance, both individually in teams and in companies. These are just a few of my favorite books, but each one of them have nuggets, long-term studies at many companies that say, if you have these conditions, people will be more successful. In 12, you learn about the 12 behaviors managers do to make work amazing for their employees and make them most productive. In Treat People Right, Edward Lawler makes the case for why creating a company that cares about human beings actually leads to bigger profits down the road. Uh, the Talent Code tells us about how to develop talent in a very, very specific way. Um, and so this is actually allowing us as organizational psychologists, as managers, as human resource professionals to actually take a whole new leap in what I call people strategy. And that is to really understand what works and what kind of conditions are going to create optimal outcomes in companies of any size. Um, OK, so part two. What is a people strategy? So you might notice that I, I don't like to use the word HR. What do you think of when you hear the word HR or human resources? Is it a positive word? No, you're like, oh, HR, HR, I have to go to HR to get help with this thing. Um, HR has a bad reputation. It has a reputation of being a bureaucratic organization, not tied to the business strategy, of uh, basically having a lot of rules that you have to try to get around, 
to get something done. Um, and at Google, we actually don't call the team I work on HR. It's called people operations. And it's very deliberate. It's a, sim it's a signal to the company that we're not going to be typical HR. We're going to focus on innovation. We're going to use data. We're going to solve core business problems. And we're going to be treated like equals. Um, and so I want to talk to you about if I was going to have a people strategy at a company of 1, 5, 10, 100, or 10,000, how I would think about it. I also want to talk about the role culture plays, because I think they're integral, but slightly related. So this is my, my framework for today. So basically, I think that there's an organizational culture that emerges, right? This is, we're going to talk about what that means in a second, but it's kind of the sum of the values, behaviors, norms in a company. Um, and that kind of overlays how you think about attracting talent, developing that talent, making that talent engaged or really committed to your work, and then hopefully keeping that talent. Because the worst thing than spending a lot of time finding the perfect person is when they leave, right? And so how do you keep those people, the ones you want to keep at your company? And I think if a company does these right, they're going to have more productivity, more innovation, and more employee happiness, which I think are the three biggest goals that we can aspire to. And it's not actually, I don't just think this, I know this through every scientific research article and all my experiences in Silicon Valley. So we're going to dive deeply into each of these sections. Have you guys seen this before? Culture? So the idea here is that culture has, when you see culture, it's these behaviors. They're above the iceberg, right? But it's really the things below that are, that are driving the culture. So the stated values or fundamental assumptions. And actually, my favorite definition of culture is it's what people do when no one's looking. Right? What do you do when no one's looking? What do you think the employees in your company do when no one's looking? That's your culture. So think about that. Um, and I think organizational culture is something that is really positive. It can support everything that we do. It can also be really negative. Um, but the way I think about it is that... Oh, I didn't do that, I guess. Okay. Um, so I have to, you have to think about your organizational culture in a specific way. How does it align to your goals? How many of you have a goal to be more innovative? Do you guys have a, is innovation a goal for your organizations? Okay, so how does your culture support innovation? Um, do you have a goal to be more productive or more efficient? How does your culture support that? Do you have a goal to have your employees be satisfied? How does your culture support that? I think it's very important um, to think about. Um, and I'm actually going to talk to you about why I think it's not a good idea to talk about culture change, but it's really about, if you do want to change something, it's really about changing those behaviors on the surface. Um, so we'll come back to that. When it comes to attracting and selecting talent, I'm really glad the previous speaker basically told you about Google's hiring process. It's actually a lot better. There are no longer 40 interviews. We actually used a lot of science to figure out the optimal number of interviews that you need to get a good um, read on a candidate. How many do you think it is? How many people do you need to have interview a candidate to know, yes, with very high certainty, this person is perfect for the company? What do you guys think? Seven. Seven. Three. Those are the only guesses? Five. Perfect. So that averages out to four. Perfect. That's our answer. <laughs> so we found at Google, we actually did, this is what I love about people operations at Google, is that we have, we have social scientists, and they went into the data, and they said, okay, we had independent interviewers interview these candidates. And they each had a score. So we take the average score, we can look at how many interviewers do we need to have to have a, let's say, a 90% prediction accuracy. Um, and so what we found out was that after four interviews, you had about 90 to 95% accuracy, and every additional interviewer only added 1% more accuracy, right? At some point, enough is enough, right? Do you really have to have everyone interview? And so we realized, okay, we want to have the best candidates but we also want to maximize for people's time. So what is that cutoff? And being able to have people on your staff who can help you make decisions like that is really powerful. So now we have a rule that most people, in general, only get four um, in-person interviews. The thing that we didn't talk about this morning yet is how do you get people to want to work for you? <laughs> we assume that we want, they want, you know, we're trying to figure out who's best for us, but it's just as important to understand what your employment brand is. 
Is that a phrase that you guys use? Employment branding? I think of it as, what is your brand to people who might want to work for you? What do people say about what it's like to work at your organization? And being very mindful and knowing what people are saying, both internally and outside the company, is really critical. And, and again, I want to ask you, how does this align to your goals? How do you make sure you're hiring for innovation? If you are an innovative company, is that coming out in your employment branding or your job website? Um, and this is a really critical thing that if you have your HR team focused on, will really improve the way that you guys hire talent and attract talent. Um, it's just as important to develop talent. Um, people are growing their entire lives. Um, so once they come to your company, they're not done. It's not like, hey, go to work. You have to invest in them, right? Um, and that is, I think, something that happens more at bigger companies, but more and more we're seeing happen at smaller companies too. And I wanted to share a few examples um, that I thought were really relevant. So, so one, going back to trend number one, as our information, as our economy changes, uh, we've also seen that people have how many jobs over the course of their lifetime? Do you guys have in Latvia a lot of job hopping now? People have like one career, then another career. So in the U.S., it's like seven to ten jobs or careers you're going to have over your lifetime. So we have a saying at Google, well, that's great. We want people to have seven to ten careers, but have them at Google. Um, and so we have a, a really big effort to develop people internally. So our first instinct is always to hire someone from another team at Google. And what you have to be really careful about is making sure that your managers have aligned incentives. They're not trying to steal talent from each other or trying to prevent them from moving. But that is a phenomenal, actually very inexpensive way, actually will save your company money through recruiting costs of developing employees. Um, one other thing that we started doing based on science is that we know that people who, are, who meditate and who are mindful are actually more productive, they're more happy, and they get sick less often. So we actually now offer meditation training um, to any Googler who wants to take it. So I actually start all my team meetings. I have a team of uh, eight people I manage globally. And every time we get together, we have one minute of just pause and breathe and disconnect. And it's amazing how much better conversations you have when you let go of whatever you were crazily thinking about right before you came in. Um, and so this is a creative way of thinking about developing your employees and making them more productive. Um, and again, one of the central ways that HR, I think, is transforming work outcomes. So this third area is about engaging talent. And I know this is kind of like a catchphrase, employee engagement, but I really love it, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> um, an employee engagement is a state where an employee is committed to the company and they're like actively contributing, right? You probably know the difference. Those people who come to work, they're so excited, they have ideas, and they'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. Do you guys have some of those people you work with? Some, hopefully a lot. Then there are people who are not engaged. They come to work, it's a paycheck. They might contribute an idea. They're not like causing any harm, but they're not really adding a lot. Do you guys know some of those? Some? Okay, and then there's a third group, and they're really, this is the bad group. Actively disengaged. These are the people who not only don't like their jobs, but they tell everybody that they don't like their jobs. Right? They're, they're starting trouble in your meetings. They're actively discouraging people. They can be downright rude. We call them bad apples and they can be contagious. This behavior spreads like a sickness or the flu in the winter. Um, and so now there's actually science that can tell us who works for me, how many are engaged, how many are not engaged, and how many are actively disengaged. And actually, um, so our goal is to have more engaged employees because actually it turns out if you have more engaged employees, they are more productive, they have better relationships with customers, they earn more money, the company makes more profit, and share price grows up. That's pretty good, right? Pretty good outcomes. Um, so this is something we should really care about in companies. And actually, sorry, the formatting didn't come out right, but um, these are the 12 questions this, co this famous company Gallup created that tell you if someone is engaged at work. And some of the things are actually not what you would think. So this one is actually really important. 
someone who is more engaged at work will say yes to, in the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for doing good work? So it turns out telling someone they did a good job, it's not enough to do it once a year, twice a year, once a month. Actually, once every seven days is critical. Think about the last time someone paid you a compliment, how good that made you feel, especially if it was a quality colleague. So recognition is a critical component that leads to employee engagement. Um, another one that I wanted to highlight for those coming to my panel this afternoon is, does the mission or purpose of your company make you feel your job is important? The people who agree with this are much more likely to be engaged. Um, and this is a great tool to use to understand both what you can do as a manager, but also to know if your employees are actually engaged. So now we get to something very interesting. Do you think in Latvia overall, or in Europe, most people are engaged, not engaged, or actively disengaged? The majority. Depends on the company. What about the whole region? Do you think there are differences by regions? All right, I'll save you. Yes, there are. <laughs> So this is actually the most recent data from Gallup, looking at, by region, what percentage of the entire workforce was engaged, not engaged, or actively disengaged. So the US and Canada are on the top with 29%. That actually seems low, but that's the highest in the world. 54% not engaged and 18% disengaged. And this changes a lot cyclically with the economy. So if you look, scroll down to Central and Eastern Europe, they have about a third as many engaged employees. That's a big difference, to have one third as many people who come to work every day saying, I love this company, I want to put in my all and do great work. That's huge. 63% um, not engaged and 26% actively disengaged. What do you think it looks like for Latvi? Same, different? Okay, so this is for um, the, the countries in the Central and Eastern Europe region. So Latvi, 13% engaged, 72% not engaged, but only 15% actively disengaged. So that's like a pretty good number. Um, and I think it's really interesting to think about what I think a lot of people are saying is the economic turnaround. To have a, a relatively small number of people in that third category compared to some of these other countries is really, really big. Um, so again, I, what I want to highlight here is that this is a phenomenal tool that science and HR have created together that I think any company with one, two, five, ten people can use to really improve their results if you pay attention to it. So the fourth piece of this model is retaining employees. So hopefully you guys know, do you guys generally know who your top talent is and who the not so great people are? People in the middle? Okay. Do you think you want to have the same strategy for keeping them? Maybe there are people you, does anyone have people they don't want to keep? Maybe a couple, okay. So, um, so the first thing I want to say about retaining is one, you have to pay attention. If you do not know today what your attrition number is, what percentage of people are leaving year over year. And if you don't know what your regretted attrition and your unregretted attrition are, that means what percentage of people who you don't want to leave are leaving and what percentage of people that you do want to leave are leaving, the low performers. If you don't know those two numbers, Go back home and figure that out because those are the two best indicators of your organizational health that I could tell you to follow. And in certain companies, hypothetically, um, we don't talk about this at Google, but you want to have a very big difference. So you hopefully very few of your top performers are leaving every year, but hopefully the people who are not doing so well, they're being managed out or they're going elsewhere because they don't see that there's a good fit. So that's one of the single best things that I could say take away and do that um, today. And the last thing I want to say here that really echoes on the first presentation is that retention is very unique and personalized. Everyone wants, even though there are some trends in human motivation, people really need different things. A young woman who's having a family for the first time, she might really care about work-life balance and flexibility versus someone who is just out of business school. They might want to be on a fast track to an executive career. Someone else might want an opportunity to work abroad. Someone else might want the opportunity to work on the hot new projects. Um, and really understanding that everything I'm talking about today should be personalized at the human level is really, really critical. So kind of how I wanted to end this second section by is saying what I think 
are your most important levers. If you want to go back and make your HR strategy, your people strategy, and your organizational culture awesome, what can you do? First one is look at yourself. If you don't believe that your people matter and that your HR strategy and your people strategy matters, none of this is going to work. Sorry, just go home. I don't even want to talk to you about, oh, hiring a consultant or having, hiring someone to do this for you. You have to believe that your people are your most valuable asset and that you genu genuinely want to make a great place to work. If your leader does not believe that, none of this is going to happen. The second thing is look back at your HR team. If you're big enough to have human resources or um, people who do hiring, reimagine them. What can they do? And there are great models for this all over the world, from big companies to small companies. Um, so spend as much time making sure you hire innovative, strategic HR people. Focus and make sure that their actions are not focused on rules and making sure you comply with laws. Of course they should do that. You don't want to get sued. But also focus their actions on the right outcomes. Innovation, productivity, employee satisfaction. That should be the goal of your HR function, is to make sure that you as a leader are achieving this. Um, and one of the things I think I love most about our focus at Google is that we have this saying, focus on the user and all else will follow. Hopefully you've used a Google product. Hopefully you feel like we really understand our users. We spend a lot of time studying them. And we say, okay, HR at Google, you also have to focus on your users. But they're not consumers all over the world. They're your employees. And having this focus and saying that we care about you as users and we're going to design a company that meets your needs is really powerful. Um, and the last two things here are kind of being willing to experiment. Um, I know it's a little scary to experiment with people's salaries and their bonuses and hiring, but if you don't try new things, you'll never learn. And I really encourage you to have that mindset when it comes to your people strategy. Um, and the last thing here is it's, it's kind of a new phrase. I don't know if it's made its way over to this part of the world, but we have this new emerging field in HR called people analytics. And these are data scientists who look at things like how many interviews are optimal to get a great outcome for a candidate? Or what are the qualities of a great manager? Or are we seeing the same number of women getting promoted as a percentage as men? These are questions that really matter. And having great people on staff who can answer these questions scientifically is really critical. And I'd say one of the most exciting fields of HR that's emerging. OK. So those are, hopefully I've made the case for for why an HR strategy and organizational culture can really impact every aspect of a business that you care about. And we talked about the culture, we talked about hiring and selecting, we talked about developing, engaging, and then retaining. Um, and kind of one of the things I wanted to help you walk away with was really things that you can just do today that might be a little different. Um, and these are things you can use to increase innovation, productivity, employee satisfaction. So, Number one, and this is what I firmly believe, you're people managers. If you have someone who manages people who's not you, it is your job to make sure that they are a fantastic manager. Because what is the number one reason people leave companies? Kind of gave you the answer, come on. Managers. Your relationship with your direct supervisor. Be honest with yourself. Think about when you're happy in your job, it's probably when you have a good manager, you have a good relationship. When you're miserable, to be honest, you probably don't have a good relationship. They're not a great manager. And really understanding that, incentivizing people to be great managers, and understanding what that means in your company is critical. So we did a huge project a few years ago at Google called Project Oxygen, and we studied our best and our worst managers and figured out what were those eight things that they did differently. Um, and they're pretty obvious, like having regular one-on-ones, being encouraging, um, providing resources, providing direct feedback and honesty. And then what we did was we built it into our training programs. We created an award for the best managers. The best 1% of managers in the company go on the most lavish, all expenses paid trip once a year to symbolize managing matters. Just like we said hiring matters, take time to do it, being a manager really matters, take time to do it. Um, and we've built a, a survey out of it. So everyone in the company can tell us anonymously twice a year, is my manager doing these behaviors? And what we do is we find the managers on the top end and say, great job. And we find the managers on the bottom end and say, 
okay, you got to get better or you can't be a manager anymore because we know the single best way to keep great people is to give them a great relationship with their manager. Um, two, kind of like what I talked about, there's this new um, method in the social science called positive deviance. Have you guys heard this before? It's a very technical term. So the idea is like in any distribution of data, for some reason on the top end, you'll have people that just, for some reason, do really great. And so what I'd say is whenever you seem to have a problem with your culture or a problem with maybe your sales numbers or your customer service platform, rather than focusing on what's broken, go to the ones that are doing something right, analyze them, and have them train the rest of the company. And this is a very positive way to spread the right behaviors through your company. Um, also, uh, at this point, I want to make kind of highlights the culture change question. Um, and there's a very famous organizational psychologist named John Katzenbach who basically says, and he's the father of organizational culture change. And his latest work is basically, stop blaming your culture <laughs> and stop saying it's wrong or it's not working and really focus on what can be done. And he says, if you have a problem in your company, figure out what are two behaviors, very specific actions that your leadership can do, two specific actions that your managers can do, and two specific actions that your entry-level staff can do in one year, train them, measure them, and see if it changes. And so you add up into culture change through behavior change. And this has really changed, I think, a, a lot of the way that companies in Silicon Valley think about changing their culture. Um, and actually, while we're on culture, I did want to share a story from um, a, a recent book um, that I thought was really interesting about maybe some of the differences between Silicon Valley and other cultures throughout the world. And it was um, a study of airline pilots and airline crashes. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of this one, but it's, it's really interesting to understand the elements of your culture and the pieces that you like and that you don't like and then work on the behaviors to change it. And so I just wanted to share this one story. Um, and so it turns out that there are certain countries that have a lot more airplane crashes per capita than other countries. Um, and it's not always about safety regulations or the quality of the airplanes. It turns out in this one analysis that it's actually all about culture and that countries that have a very high level of hierarchy and they don't tolerate diverse opinions, they have much higher rates of crashes. And they looked at some of these cockpit recordings when someone's like crashing into a mountain or missing the runway. And it turns out there's always someone in the cockpit, maybe a junior pilot, who knows something's going to happen, but they're scared to say it because they're worried they're going to cause a problem with their boss. And that's a very core element to some cultures, um, some countries' culture. But in this case, I'd say it's not leading to great outcomes. Um, and so it's really important to kind of reassess the elements of your culture and see if they're actually meeting your needs. Um, I thought that was a particularly interesting case of, of thinking about what pieces of your culture you want to keep and which ones you don't. And so obviously the takeaway is countries that had more hierarchy and less openness to criticism had higher rates of failure because people weren't open to saying the truth and saying that something was broken. Um, how are we doing with time? Okay. okay. So the last two things I think I really want to mention are personalization and diversity. So personalization um, is just this idea that not everyone is the same. One size does not fit all. And when you think about the people who work for you and your strategy and also your users out there in the world, um, personalization is becoming a really big trend. Um, and when you think about hiring people and the negotiation process or developing them or retaining them, really keep that in mind and really ask your managers to keep that in mind. And the last one I want to mention is maybe a little counterintuitive, but there's a growing recognition that diversity of thought, diversity of experience, gender, race, leads to better outcomes. And at Google, we try really hard to hire people from all different walks of life. And our, our general theory is this. If your users represent the world, they're 51% female, um, they're all different ages, all different backgrounds. And the people, your engineers, or the people who are selling to them, if they, don't, if they don't look like them or they don't have the same background, do you really understand their needs? Do you really, can you really design for them? Can you design, is the phone small enough to fit in a woman's hand, not some big phone that <laughs> like fits in a guy's hand? You know, I hate those phones, you can't put them in your hand. Um, 
And we've, we've taken a big bet on investing in diversity in our workforce. And it's something that I think is going to become a trend in the next decade for companies of all shapes and sizes. And I think especially in cognitive diversity, making sure that you hire people who think differently than you. They don't just, they didn't go to the same school as you. They're from the same town in, or the same region as you. Um, those people are sometimes going to be the best asset on your team. And you're going to see more and more that companies are going to care about diversity um, in the next decade. OK. So those are kind of hopefully five useful tools that you can use. So I wanted to end my presentation by sharing some possibilities. Um, as I mentioned, my husband is a futurist, so he's always thinking, what if this existed? And as I was preparing my talk, I've been talking to a lot of my American Latvian friends or my Latvian friends in, um, back here in Riga, and I wanted to just put out some ideas for you just because I'm on stage and when do I get to do this? <laughs> And so one question to you, and I want you to imagine this. What if Latvian employees were the most engaged in the entire EU? What if that number went from, what was it, like 13%, 11% to 25%? What would happen? What kind of businesses would be created? What kind of wealth would be created? How could you improve your school systems? Because this applies also to public employees. This has nothing necessarily to do with companies versus nonprofits versus government. This applies to any organization. What if? And I would think it would be astounding to say Latvia has the most engaged employees in the world or in the EU. The world would be better. OK, so the second thing is a passion of mine. Um, as we heard, there's a huge shortage of talent in the tech industry. If you guys are in the tech industry, you know how hard it is to hire people who have a very specific background. So the field that is really underrepresented all over the world is computer science, programming, computer languages. In the United States, we have a shortage. We only have one graduate studying computer science for every three open jobs. And so you've probably heard of some other countries in the area, maybe Estonia, um, who have done a great job of actually starting to teach, teach kids in primary school computer science. And I actually, when I think about what is one single thing Latvia could do to just become a powerhouse in the world economy, I say, what if all Latvian students learn computer science, primary school and secondary school? It's one of the most growing fields, the highest in demand, um, and really requires early education for someone to fall in love with it. So I wanted to put that out there. What if? What if that was the case? And the last question is kind of the sum of everything I've talked about today. We care about organizational culture, HR strategy. These pieces make companies more productive, more effective, more profitable. Being engaged also means you get sick less often, right? These are great things. So what if Latvian companies were known as the best places to work in the world? I'm not even talking about being able to pay people more or being able to work on global businesses, but what if going to work whether it's in the government, in schools, in companies, in Latvia, it was known as the best place in the world to be an employee. What would happen? And that's kind of the question I want to leave you with today. So thank you. Well, this. Pat manai vienu cilvēku CIB, šis tas, ko dzirdēt par šiem cilvēku resursiem. Vai jums ir kādi jautājumi? Any questions? Jautājumi? Lūdzu, please. Thank you, the great Google for your job. Well, OK. Thank you, Google. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, back there. Uz to pusi rekur tur pie ejas vidū. Hi, I'm Katri Liekkila from Aalto University in Finland, and I have two questions. Uh, first one is about employee engagement. I want to know your opinion if you think age or different generations, just as uh, X or Y, if they have an impact on employee engagement. And then I would like to know what is the average age of Google employees at the moment? Yes. So the second one, unfortunately, I can't answer. We, um, we don't share a lot about our employee population. Um, but it's getting older every year. <laughs> we have a lot of babies. Um, so um, on the first question, I do think there are differences. We call them millennials or Generation X. I think a lot of people um, who are older look down on millennials 
and they say they're selfish or self-involved, but I actually think they're just as great employees. I just think they have very different needs. And so if you think about the context which millennials grew up in, they grew up in a world with basically, they didn't experience any war, right, um, most of them, and most of them don't experience a lot of poverty. They might not have everything they want, but everyone somehow has an iPhone. I don't know how they can afford iPhones. And so I'd say the biggest difference I've seen is in their communication styles and their motivations. And I find um, the people that I work with who are in their 20s, they really care about a couple things. Um, one is learning. They want to be learning something new all the time. They've done it for a year, they're done and want to move on to the next thing. And that can, so I would say as a manager, as a company, learn to leverage that. Have that person become the go-to to learn a new, um, a new industry or a new tool or go out and meet other people. And I think that the second thing they really care about is making a positive impact on the world. So when I was talking about changing motivations, this is something we just see across um, is happening more and more. They don't just want a job that's a paycheck. They want it to feel really connected. And so um, I think that is the imperative of the business owners and the leaders to really understand that and make sure that the workplace is going to meet those needs. Because honestly, they're great employees. They're the most educated we've ever had, the most tech savvy we've ever had. And in my experience, they work pretty hard. I don't know how it is everywhere, but um, they're great employees. OK, welcome to your time. I said, do my sweat out to. Should be? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, is there any data out there on, um, which would reflect the return of the company depending on the how, how much the company invests in the I HR as such, yeah. uh, showing sort of a percentage yeah. or efficiency of having such system? And, and maybe relating, the other question is, is, is this HR systems, etc. is this, or to what extent is this the luxury of uh, SMEs or just large corporates? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I've never seen it, it's really hard to do controlled studies looking at that, right? Because it's like, what's the dependent variable? It's like, what does it mean to be successful? So I've never seen a study that looks at investment in HR per like return. But I, what I can say is that most of what I talked about today is free, right? Um, actually, usually when people want to hear about Google, they want to know about all the perks and the buses that take you to work and all this amazing stuff. And we actually say it's, it's actually not about the stuff that's really expensive, but it's about changing your behavior and your priorities. I do recognize that having a better or more qualified HR staff could be more expensive, but I would say um, definitely worth, worth the investment, and it actually doesn't have to be as expensive as it might sound. It's actually just about finding the right couple of people to hire to really help you think through this. Okay. Um, man šķiet, ka es daudz uzņēmu vārdā uzdošu vienu jautājumu. Uh, I think I'm oh. going to be speaking on okay. behalf of a lot of uh, business people around here. They, uh, they probably think, well, you're complaining about not being, you know, the demand for employees being bigger than the supply, right? Yeah. Well, what about us here? We, uh, you know, we, we would usually have to... Uh, hire someone and then re-educate and make yeah. him fit for the company, right? So that would be the challenge. Can you talk about a little bit yeah. about that? When you actually, because of the anemic nature of the labor yeah. market, you just don't have the uh, specialists that you need. So what would be, the, uh, what would be your advice on strategies yeah. or how to, uh, how to make that done? Yeah. So I'd say every company's HR should have a different goal, right? If you're if you're focused on not having the right talent, where should you prioritize? Developing your talent, right? We're actually, um, actually I can't share that. So I think some companies, um, they're recognizing that sometimes people come out of even some very expensive private schools in the US with not the right education, right? And so more and more companies are starting to have some kind of education period at the beginning of what you're doing. So I would say you'd probably, if you have one HR person, um, I would say skip focusing on the other pieces and prioritize your time on developing because I think there is some really great evidence that shows that you can develop talent within the company. I know um, in the U.S. military, they had this crazy story where they developed a really good training program and helped average, actually high school dropouts, so people who weren't really motivated enough to finish high school, they trained them to be like nuclear engineers in like seven weeks. 
Um, and so I would just say it can be done. Just think creatively and just focus all your energy on that one part of the problem. Okay. Okay, then I'll have the final question. I, um, I worked for a number of companies, um, and at one place, all I saw the manager was doing, she was just fighting back demands for greater pay. You know, I thought it was, you know, does that mean if there are any managers around here who spend most of their time just fighting against, I want a bigger salary, I want a bigger salary, and that's what they, uh, all, uh, all their days spent on that. Does that mean that something is wrong with the management of the company? So the managers fighting for their own pay? No, 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 fighting against their uh, employees' demands for greater pay. Yeah, I think there's definitely something wrong with that company. Um, I think I think you legitimately have to understand what you can offer in the market, right? right? You have to understand salaries and do market pricing and make sure you can do that. So that's one thing. But I think, I think it's a failure of leadership to allow that management behavior to continue. Because I think that manager's manager should not allow that to happen. Right. And that manager should, the manager's manager should have a way to talk to the employees and say, is your manager spending time talking with you about your job, about how you can do better work with your clients? Um, are they positively impacting your world? And there needs to be a feedback loop between the different chains in the organization. So I'd say, yes, there's absolutely a problem in the structure there, and that it's the job of the leadership to make sure that they, they know what's happening at levels below them. Okay, here with the bridge. Thank you very much. Thank All you.